I think we can get started with our next talk. We're going to learn about right heart for the internist, which I just learned is a double meaning. So I'm very excited about the title now. I'm sure you take it away. Yeah, thanks, Lauren. Um, yeah, this talk is inspired by patient cases that I have seen now in my two and a half years as a resident. Um, and so I'm hoping that all of us can learn from them together. Um, I think that uh, I look through the audience, I think Ruth and Hasib may have seen part of this talk on Wednesday. I presented it at the Harborview Noon Conference. And so I attempted to answer at least some of Ruth's questions, but um, we'll see if we can add something to their knowledge as well. So to dive right in, so my learning objective, um, I'd like to focus on the pathophysiology of right heart dysfunction. And in particular, looking at three common scenarios. So the initial diagnosis in clinic, uh, inpatient management of acute right heart failure, and then also chronic, chronic right heart failure. And um, I'm focusing here on the pathophysiology in particular because as we'll see, there isn't a ton of evidence to guide us in managing uh, patients with right heart failure. And so we really have to rely on our baseline knowledge of pathophysiology um, to help us make clinical decisions. Don't have any conflicts of interest. And let's dive right in and we'll start with looking at the gross anatomy of the ventricles. So this is a cross section um, and it's showing us the right ventricle and the left ventricle, which I've shown kind of with approximated shapes here. And just right off the bat, you can notice that there's some remarkable differences um, in the size of both ventricles, in the shape, um, in the wall thickness. And this is something that is changing throughout development, and we'll get into it a little bit more. Um, comparing them directly, so when we're taught anatomy and pathophysiology, most of what we're taught is focused on the left ventricle. Um, and as we're seeing in the, private, in the prior picture, it's elliptical in shape. Things that I didn't know, um, it moves in three different fashions. It um, has torsioning, so the muscle, it's the, the ventricle itself is twisting. The walls are thickening, and they're also shortening. And there are three layers of muscle that are responsible for making this happen. It's thick-walled, and we know that. And the coronary blood flow happens during diastole. And we're taught that that happens because of the wall tension in the left ventricle, that because the wall tension is so high um, during systole, during the left ventricular contraction, coronary blood flow can't, um, can't get in. Um, in contrast, when we look at the right ventricle, it has a different shape. It's triangular, it's crescentic it only moves in one way, it only shortens, and shortens longitudinally. And that's in particular because it only has two layers of muscle. So already we're seeing that it is vulnerable and weaker than, than the left ventricle. It's thin-walled, and if you were to average the mass of everyone's LV versus their RV, um, you'd find that it, it's about one-fifth of the mass of the LV, so quite small. And Coronary blood flow happens primarily during systole. This is a stark difference. And Ruth, during my first um, lecture um, afterwards, asked me, you know, why does this happen? And I, I tried to look into it a little bit more. And really, it's because the right ventricle just doesn't generate as much force during systole. Um, it doesn't have to. Um, pump blood against such a dramatic afterload. And so it allows for coronary blood flow to happen during systole. And what that means functionally is that it develops and is used to chronically having blood flow during systole. And, and if there's an interruption to that, it can be a sudden change for the ventricle itself. And then lastly, uh, the tricuspid valve is an important thing to mention when considering right ventricular function, in particular because it's pretty vulnerable. Uh, the annulus is vulnerable to dilation. The valve itself 
by a function of how it's attached to the myocardium is um, uh, more vulnerable to structural deformation and regurgitation. And so there's really not a whole lot that's similar between the ventricles, except for the fact that they pump, they both pump blood. So let's dive into the right ventricle. And I have here a few um, pictures that I'll go through um, that I think will hopefully solidify our understanding of the pathophysiology. So on these slides, the left side is always going to be a normal adult heart. And on the right side, we're going to see how the adult heart is responding to some type of stress. And in this particular case, we're looking at an adult heart responding to acute stress in the form of increased volume. And so let's say um, you're, you're seeing a patient um, who has tachycardia in the hospital. And you're wondering, you know, is this tachycardia related to pain, to anxiety, to some type of arrhythmia, um, to volume depletion? And you say, I'm going to practice high value care and let's just try a, a, a fluid bolus and see if it improves. And so you give a one liter fluid bolus. And this is how the right heart responds to that bolus. It's able to reversibly dilate. And so we're seeing an increase in size. And as long as that dilation occurs um, along the Frank Starling curve and doesn't overload the RV, the RV is able to increase its contractility and handle that bolus with no problem. And so the RV is considered, it's considered to be volume tolerant, um, but we'll see next that it's pressure intolerant. And so here we have the adult RV with acute stress in the form of increased afterload. And so an example of this would be you're admitting a patient to Harborview who has a multifocal pneumonia. And because of that pneumonia, they, their lung is responding with hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction to preferentially um, move blood towards areas of well-ventilated and oxygenated lung. But that increases the RV's afterload. And the RV temporarily is able to increase its contractility. And in the case of increased afterload, there's no change in its chamber size. But what happens if that increased stress in the form of volume or pressure is persistent? And that's what I'd like to focus on today. So we're seeing here that the normal adult, adult heart is on our left. On the right, there are structural changes that start to occur with increased volume or increased pressure. And those structural changes in particular are dilation of the RV. And I'll, I'll highlight that, that that I think is one of the most important hallmark findings. And because of that dilation, we start to see septal flattening and compression of the left ventricle. And the left ventricle can start to appear what, what they call D-shaped. And if you're savvy with um, point of care ultrasound, these are changes that you can notice on the ultrasound um, in a parasternal short axis view. I'm going to do a quick aside here because we rotate through card A at the U and we see folks with some abnormalities in their heart that have been going on since, since childhood. And I just want to mention that the pediatric heart is a little different. On the left here, I have a fetal heart, a normal fetal heart. And say that someone has a congenital heart disease that um, results in chronic stress on the right ventricle. Um, the fetal heart, you can see, has more, more, more similar RV and LV chamber sizes. And you can notice that the RV has a much thicker wall. And if that stress, if there's a stress on it that's persistent throughout childhood and development, then you can see what's called persistent RV hypertrophy. And so um, folks with congenital heart disease have a much thicker RV myocardium and have very different hemodynamics. In contrast, you see normal adult development on the bottom where the RV has, um, the, the myocardium has thinned, it's more crescentic, and the LV has enlarged. So going back to the adult RV, um, and thinking about persistent stress, I've broken down some of the changes here for us to just ruminate on. 
And the early changes that happen with stress are in increase in contractility and no change in size. If it's persistent, the RV begins to hypertrophy because it's trying to maintain its stroke volume. But eventually, we get RV dilation. And I'll mention here that that dilation, once it starts to happen, is pretty much irreversible. Or it is, it's at least irreversible for what we have at our disposal right now in terms of therapeutics. And what happens with that RV dilation is we get a decrease in contractility, a loss of the coordination between the RA and the RV, and a rise in filling pressures in the right heart. That leads to dilation of the tricuspid annulus, functional tricuspid regurgitation, and eventually, if left unchecked, right heart failure. And so as I mentioned before, this RV dilation is really a key change. So I'll pause there really quickly. Um, we've gone through the pathophysiology um, and talked about what happens with persistent stress. Do we have any questions before I dive into some cases? Great. So our first case um, is a patient in clinic. And I'll walk us through the case. It's a 67-year-old woman. She has a history of hepatitis C and cirrhosis. She's establishing care with a new primary care doctor, and you're her new primary care doctor. She feels well. She, has, she doesn't have any chest pain, dyspnea, orthopnea. She's a thin woman. Uh, her cardiovascular exam is notable for a holosystolic murmur heard at the left lower sternal border. She has a prominent JVP and edema, as well as a distended abdomen. She's not taking any medications, and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I've got quite a bit to do on this first visit. I'm going to get some blood work. What else is necessary right now? As her new PCP, what's your next step? And we have a poll. treated hepatitis C virus, Ryan's asking. She has not been treated, but she's cleared her viral load. Alrighty, so we've got a nice 50-50 split basically between doing an echo and doing all of the above. And I think everyone's right on the money here, that probably the echo is the first thing that we want. Um, but considering all of them, really, I mean, we're thinking about starting her on Lasix and spironolactone. That seems reasonable. Um, you may have some hesitation in doing so without having the baseline lab work back. The echocardiogram, it sounds like people are thinking about, you know, she has a prominent JVP. She has a whole systolic murmur. What's going on in her heart? Referring to hepatology because she has cirrhosis, dietary salt restriction because that's important for everyone with cardiac problems and cirrhosis. And so I selected all of the above as, as the best answer here, um, but definitely the echocardiogram is, is where our money is. So consolidating this case one, we have a patient with cirrhosis and clinical signs of intravascular hypervolemia. And the PCP obtains an echocardiogram. And I'll challenge you all a little bit to think about, you wanted this echo, what in particular are you looking for? You can just type it into the chat. Yeah, Brandon saying evidence of elevated right-sided pressures. Tom saying a dilated RV, wanting to know pulmonary pressures, RV size and function. Perfect. Okay, 
Yeah, so these are all, oh, and then tricuspid valve abnormalities. Nice, so you guys are right on the money. So I have some information for you, things that you wanted. Her PA systolic pressure was 94 millimeters of mercury. So that's quite high. She does have pulmonary artery changes, severe PA enlargement, and then severe uh, artery hypertrophy. A little bit more, she's got moderate tricuspid regurge and severe pulmonic regurge. And people are wondering about signs of RV dysfunction. And I gave a, a few particular markers of that, in particular the basal RV diameter, basically looking for RV dilation. The TAPSI, which some of us may now be more savvy with as we've been taking care of patients in the COVID ICU on ECMO and looking for signs of right heart dysfunction. But basically, the right heart, as I mentioned before, it only contracts in, in one fashion, and that is longitudinal shortening. And so the TAPSI basically is a measure of the movement of the tricuspid annulus in that longitudinal plane. Um, and quantifying it is a good marker of, of, of RV function. And then lastly is the RV fractional area change, which is kind of like the RVEF. But basically this patient has mild RV dysfunction. And so she goes on, her primary, her primary care doctor refers her to a cardiologist. She has a right heart cath and ultimately is diagnosed with portal pulmonary hypertension. She started on sildenafil, furosemide, spironolactone, and has improvement in her venous congestion and establishes care with hepatology and um, is doing well, is feeling better. So really this is a, an interesting case because we see that it's a patient with cirrhosis who we could easily just have chalked up some of her abnormalities, her volume overload um, to cirrhosis. But I think the key point here is that we saw intravascular hypervolemia. And when we see that, we need to be thinking about other causes of congestion and in particular cardiac causes. Any questions about that first case? Awesome. And this was actually a patient that was admitted to uh, Medicine C at Harborview last month. So real life scenario. Now we have case two. A uh, patient hospitalized with acute right heart failure. Something that's maybe a little bit more scary for all of us to deal with. So this is a 65-year-old man, recently diagnosed pancreatic cancer, presenting to the Harborview ED with chest pain, shortness of breath, and unilateral leg swelling. You're the Medic One doc, and you took the phone call um, in the Medic One room, the medics were worried about a PE, you were worried about it as well. You met him on arrival and decided, hey, let's go straight to a CT pulmonary angiogram um, on the stretcher. The CT shows large bilateral pulmonary emboli with an RV to LV ratio greater than one, which is abnormal. His initial vital signs are heart rate of 125 and a blood pressure of 70 over 40. He's in mild distress, he's having chest pain, but he's maintaining well. His exam reveals an elevated JDP and cool extremities. EKG does not reveal any acute ischemic changes, and the ED attending steps away to call the PERT team, the PE response team, to discuss possible interventions. He leaves you in charge to manage the patient. The nurse has obtained IV access, is sending some labs, and starting a heparin drip. What's the next best step? Your last couple of votes in. All right. 
So we've got quite a variety of, of votes here. So I'll just walk through all of the answer choices. Um, the first answer, answer choice A, giving a one liter IV fluid bolus. Now, it's an interesting answer choice because it's probably the most easily accessible intervention. But what I'll mention here is that this patient has intravascular hypervolemia on exam. JVP is elevated and is also cool. And so we're beginning to think maybe this patient is in, in maybe this patient is in cardiogenic shock. And so I'll challenge you and say maybe the IV fluid bolus is not the best intervention here if we have other options available. Obtaining an echo is definitely a reasonable choice here. We want to know what's going on with the heart for the same reasons that we previously mentioned. This is possibly cardiogenic shock. I'll argue that dobutamine is probably our best intervention if we can get it quickly um, because of the concern for cardiogenic shock and intravascular congestion. Um, and also it's after load reduction properties. Norepinephrine is a presser and in particular in right heart failure can increase our pulmonary, uh, pulmonary pressures and increase RV afterload. And so the answer, the correct answer here is starting with the Do we have any questions about this case? So I think this is a good time to go into some of the pathophysiology in the RV and talk a little bit more about why choosing an inotrope in this situation is the best option. So with this gentleman, he has an acute pulmonary embolism. And what we're seeing is an acute increase in the right heart's afterload. When we looked at increases in, our, in the right heart afterload, especially when they start to persist, we remember now from our, our prior slides that there can be some structural changes in the heart. The septal flattening, the D-shaping of the LV, and what that leads to is a low cardiac output and eventually cardiogenic shock, which this patient had. In parallel, we have progressive RV dilation dilation of the tricuspid annulus, functional tricuspid regurgitation, and that regurgitation results in persistent RV afterload or RV volume overload, re re resulting in even more dilation. And lastly, we see that when the RV afterload is increased, there's an increase in the RV wall tension resulting in decreased coronary blood flow and eventually RV ischemia. And in particular, the RV is susceptible to this because as we mentioned before, at baseline, the RV has very easy access to coronary blood flow. It's able to get blood during both systole and diastole. And it doesn't, during development, it's not forced to to create some of the mechanisms that the LV had to create to deal with that increased RV, deal with that increased wall tension. And so much more susceptible to RV ischemia. Now, when we break this down, we see that all of these different components are definitely interrelated. And so we have this spiral and some of you have, may have received teaching on this before, but there's, this is basically called, in a very morbid sense, the RV circle of death or spiral of death, because if this is left unchecked, it leads to RV failure. It leads to irreversible damage in the form of ischemia and dilation. And if you cross a certain point, there is no going back. It looks like we have some comments here. Cody is saying, this is a case where one size fits all approach is that the RV is preload dependent we need more nuanced understanding of that. That's exactly right. Shiv is asking, in general, if there's a transient reversible cause of ele elevated PESP, can you make a diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension? Or, you, or do you need longstanding elevated PASP? Yeah, Shiv, that's a great question. Um, so for this patient, 
he does have acute pulmonary hypertension. If we were to make a diagnosis of chronic pulmonary hypertension, um, we, would, we would need to see after the pulmonary embolism has been addressed, if that P elevated PSB has been persistent. Um, it's, it's possible that this patient with pancreatic cancer has been throwing clots chronically and could have CTEF or some other pathophysiology. Andrew is agreeing with Cody, yeah. And Jenna, yeah, exactly right. So yeah, so wouldn't this fall into the obstructive shock bucket? That's a great point. Um, in this particular case, we're seeing an overlap between what we call obstructive shock and cardiogenic shock because the LV is actually affected by the acute increase in an afterload because we're seeing that there's structural changes in the heart. And the, the nuance in terms of selecting what type of shock it is, is, is important because if we were to say it's obstructive shock, then we would be managing it as obstructive shock with lytics and, and treatment of the acute PE. And in, in, in this case, we should be doing that. But it's also important to recognize cardiogenic shock here because or do some type of intervention to address the obstruction is to use inotropes. And so it's, it's a little bit more complicated than saying, you know, this is one type of shock versus the other. Um, I think it's both. Molly, if RV is acutely failing though, we probably need to not add more fluid because it will worsen contractility on Frank's Starling curve. Yeah, Molly, that's exactly right. And so that's why inotropes, early inotropes is important here. If we were to give that one liter fluid bolus, what we would do is we would worsen the dilation of the RV. We would increase the RV wall tension. We would worsen the D shaping of the LV. And in particular, we would go in the wrong direction. And this patient would likely need inotropes in, in combination with diuretics as a supportive measure while we are addressing the obstruction, which is the pulmonary embolism. Fantastic points here um, in the chat. Thank you guys all for, for thinking critically about this. Any other questions? Now, we started to get into it a little bit because we were really we were really excited, and this is a patient in the ED, and we want to get to it quickly. Um, but I wanted to to simplify it a little bit in terms of management into three categories of what we can do to halt this spiral of death, and hopefully not reach a point of irre irreversible damage to the right heart. The first thing we can do is to manage preload. So what that means is optimizing the patient's volume status. If the patient appears volume overloaded, finding a way to get that volume off. And with the right heart, that can be really, really difficult. Um, usually it's in the form of diuresis, but the right heart is very sensitive to large fluid shifts. And so you may see that you give a dose of IV diuretic and they respond briskly to it and they become hypotensive. And so, Low, slow, um, slow and progressive diuresis is usually the name of the game. And our goal in managing preload is really to reverse the R RV dilation. Next, we can manage the afterload. So if it's a case of obstructive shock as this is, then we want to, we want to manage that with lytics, heparin, whatever is possible. Um, if it's someone who has another etiology of an acute rise in afterload, um, such as ARDS in our patients with COVID pneumonia, we can try a pulmonary vasodilator, um, inhaled epoprostenol, to see if we can reduce the pulmonary pressures. And the other thing that's really important is to minimize the intrathoracic pressure. And what that means is, um, practically speaking, is avoiding positive pressure ventilation. So, if you put someone on a mechanical ventilator, you're gonna be increasing their intrathoracic pressure and increasing their RV afterload. In particular, in patients who are having acute RV failure, intubation, because it's such an acute rise in the intrathoracic pressure, is extremely dangerous. 
you may have encountered patients that are in need of some surgery, um, anesthesia is, is wanting their PA pressures to be below some certain threshold. And that's exactly why, because intubation with that acute change um, can be very dangerous. And lastly, we want to promote inotropy. And what that means is we want to manage the metabolic derangements. So if there's acidemia, if there's hypoxemia, we want to make sure we're promoting oxygen delivery to the heart, allowing the heart to, to uh, work in a supportive atmosphere. We want to aggressively manage any arrhythmias because that would definitely worsen our inotropy, and then use IV inotropes if necessary. Awesome. Let me just review the chat as well, see what, we, see what else we got. Jenna, Teresa, I think. Yeah, exactly. So it's a little bit outside the scope of this talk um, just because of time, but different pressors have effect on the PA, the PA pressures. So if you're dealing with someone who has pulmonary hypertension, acute or chronic, the pressors of, cho the pressors of choice is really limited to one, which is vasopressin. Um, norepi, phenylephrine all act on the pulmonary vasculature and cause pulmonary vascular constriction and would increase afterload. Um, in this case, dobutamine, which is an inotrope, has a secondary benefit because it can also decrease afterload. It has some vasodilation. Um, and so it would hopefully improve the afterload as well as increasing inotropy in this patient. Cool. All righty, great case. Well, let's move on to case three. So a patient hospitalized with chronic right heart failure. So this is a 52-year-old woman has a history of group one idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. And I took care of her with Ken in the UW MICU as a second year. She is on IV triprostanil, mastitentin, and sildenafil, what we call triple therapy for uh, PAH. And she's coming into the MICU for workup of acute shortness of breath. On admission, her heart rate is 82. Her blood pressure is 91 over 52. And I'll mention that this is pretty close to her baseline blood pressure. She's usually in the 80s to 90s systolic. And that's a, that's a matter of the triprostanil. It can cause systemic hypotension chronically. BMP and CBC are unchanged from a recent, recent clinic visit, normal electrolytes. Shortly after she arrives in the MICU, you notice that her rhythm on telemetry is irregularly irregular. An EKG confirms atrial fibrillation with a ventricular rate of 91. Her blood pressure is 85 over 48. So slightly lower, but kind of unchanged. What is your next step? All right, people are thinking hard about this one. All righty. Yeah, so we've got a great spread of answer choices here with most people selecting answer choices B or D. So let's talk about it. In my opinion, the best answer choice here is answer choice D, to coordinate urgent cardioversion with cardiology. But let's talk through all the choices. So the first answer choice is to start metoprolol tartrate. 
in someone with atrial fibrillation with elevated rates, um, AFib with RVR, that might be a good answer choice. Um, you could be concerned that what if this patient goes into RVR and I want to rate control her? And you're thinking about metoprolol in that scenario. Unfortunately, the consensus um, in patients with right heart failure is to avoid beta blockade. And I'll mention that the evidence to support that is fairly mixed. There is data to suggest that patients with right heart dysfunction have um, sympathetic overdrive and thus may benefit from beta blockers. But practically speaking, all of the case reports where patients have been started on beta blockers show negative outcomes and decreased exercise tolerance. B, continue to monitor for signs of hemodynamic instability. In this case, we have a patient who has right heart failure um, and is an AFib. And the practical consideration of why it's significant that this patient is an AFib is that in patients with right heart failure, their right ventricle is preload dependent. And we've, we've been talking a little bit about it in the chat, and I think this is a good time to really dive into it deeply. What we see is that the right heart is dilated, and we don't want it to dilate further, but we also don't want it to um, be empty because then it won't be able to generate the force needed to push against the dramatic afterload that it's dealing with. And so the right heart is preload dependent. And what happens when someone has an atrial arrhythmia and has right heart dysfunction? The right heart, the right ventricle in particular, is incredibly dependent on the right atrium for ventricular preload. So what that means is you have your systemic blood pressure coming in, um, your venous blood pressure rather, it's really low. It's zero to five millimeters of mercury, and it's coming into the right atrium. And in order for it to go from the right atrium to the right ventricle, our heart is really dependent on the right atrial kick. And when someone has an atrial arrhythmia, they lose that right atrial kick, and they lose that ventricular preload. And so continuing to monitor for signs of hemodynamic instability in a patient with right heart dysfunction is unfortunately not the right answer choice. And someone with a normal heart it might have been. Giving one liter of IV fluids. I mentioned that the patient is um, preload dependent. And so acutely, if you're unable to coordinate cardioversion um, promptly, then giving IV fluids may help. But once again, we talked a little bit about why that's not a good long-term solution. And it's not going to help the patient in the long term because it's going to lead to more RV dilation it's going to lead to more RVE wall tension and ischemia. And so really the right answer choice here is to coordinate urgent cardioversion with, with cardiology. And so in this patient, we have group one PAH and new onset AFib. And I talked about before, the right atrial kick is crucial for right ventricular preload and right ventricular preload is especially important in right heart dysfunction. And so we have to manage these atrial arrhythmias urgently. And our focus is not on rate control, rather it's on rhythm control with a focus on return to sinus rhythm. And so I wanna ask you guys, you know, we have this patient who needs a cardioversion. How are we gonna make that happen? Not on anticoagulation, what would be the best way to cardiovert this patient? It, the usual response would be, to do a TEE cardioversion. But with the TEE, we need to intubate a patient. Does anyone have any ideas? Yeah, it's really tough. And this is something that I learned from. So this patient, oh yeah, Kim, Amio. Yeah, so definitely a great thought. Could we chemically cardiovert this patient? And what I'll mention is that when we're doing a cardioversion, our two options are 
why would we need to do a TE credit version? Perfect. Yeah. So let me let me let me step back. So we decided that this patient needs rhythm control. So they need a cardioversion. That could be chemical cardioversion or electrical cardioversion. This is a patient that has new onset AFib, and we don't know the duration of this AFib. She's been asymptomatic. It could have been going on for some time. And so what we're worried about in particular is could this patient have a left atrial thrombus? And when we cardioavert her, return her to sinus rhythm, would that thrombus shoot out and go to her brain, go to some other organ and cause, cause a stroke or ischemia? And so usually when we're cardioverting someone for atrial fibrillation, we, we want to ensure that there's no thrombus. And so this patient had an urgent cardiac CT and assessed for atrial thrombus and then went forward with electrical cardioversion. Yeah, Cody, does this count for emergent cardioversion for hemodynamic instability? Yeah, it, it doesn't. So urgent versus emergent. And it's, it's a matter where it's, it's maybe even a little bit outside my wheelhouse to know um, at which point we would need to just do it. Um, I think what's reassuring to me in this patient's case uh, was that her blood pressure remained around her baseline and we had time to get the cardiac CT and, and coordinate a more safe approach. Um, I think definitely this patient, when, when this happened, we had, the pacer, we had the pads on immediately. And if there was any sign, sign that the patient was decompensating, we would have just done it right then and there. But this was the safe, safe approach in the moment. Awesome. Yeah. Great points. So, like I mentioned before, this patient's RV is dilated at baseline. Um, the LV is being compromised by that dilation, really thin RV wall. I talked a little bit about, a little bit about the preload dependence. And I just want to mention that there's a really fine balance between volume overload and volume depletion. And in these patients with chronic right heart failure, the perfect balance is sometimes really hard to find. Um, it's really hard to find because any big shifts can tip them out of that balance. We give them a dose of diuretic and they become hypotensive and develop an AKI. We give them some fluids and they become hypotensive and tachycardic and we start to see an impairment in their LV and their LV output. And so these are patients in which small fluid boluses, small doses of diuretics initially until we see their response are, are the way to go. And it's all, there's no, there's not great evidence to guide us here, which is what makes this so difficult. We have to rely on our clinical intuition. We have to monitor the patient very closely and learn about their right heart while we are managing them. So I wanna take a little bit of time as we're wrapping up here to just review some of the etiologies of right heart failure so that we can leave this lecture having in our minds situations in which we should have a high clinical suspicion, in which we should be doing the extra physical exam, exam maneuvers to see if someone has intravascular congestion. Um, and etiologies of acute right heart failure that we see here, ARDS due to hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. I've myself experienced this in the past year working in the COVID ICUs and seeing these patients on ECMO with severe ARDS who develop right heart dysfunction, become volume overloaded, and we struggle, we struggle, we struggle to get that volume off. Acute pulmonary embolism, like the case that we saw, mechanical ventilation, um, increasing the RV afterload. Situations in which there's impaired right heart filling. So that might be shock, SVC syndrome, hypovolemia, or constrictive physiology. And then coronary ischemia, which is outside the scope of this talk as well, but 
um, definitely can can target the right heart alone and leave the left heart unscathed. And then etiologies of chronic right heart, heart failure, pulmonary hypertension, a huge um, umbrella of, of conditions, congenital heart disease, acquired valvular abnormalities, infiltrative cardiomyopathies, chronic ischemic heart disease, and then left heart failure can cause right heart failure, and you can have someone who has biventricular problems. So just a few scenarios in which we should check ourselves and say, hey, did I look at the right heart? Am I considering what will happen if I give this patient fluids? So in summary, a few pearls here. So it's important to recognize conditions that may put patients at risk for right heart dysfunction. Use your exam, rely on your exam to aid you in making this diagnosis. Look for signs of right-sided congestion, hepatomegaly, JVP elevation, lower extremity edema, early satiety as a, as a history finding. Patients with right heart dysfunction are sensitive to fluid shifts. They usually need diuresis and just use caution with fluid boluses. Manage any atrial arrhythmias aggressively because that right atrial kick is crucial to, pro to providing the right ventricular preload. And then lastly, positive pressure ventilation, and in particular, intubation can cause acute rises in afterload and be dangerous to these patients. So with that, I think we had a great, great discussion. Um, I'll take any other questions. And let me just review to make sure I didn't miss anything. Oh yeah, Molly's asking here, she's wondering what would be cases of, of obstructive shock where we would consider fluids? Yeah, that's a great question, Molly. Um, it looks like folks answered and said tamponade is, is likely the big one. Um, but I think that the point to make is that sometimes we need to buy time. And the consequences of hypotension and shock are, um, can sometimes be irreversible consequences. And so while fluids acutely may be the wrong answer, sometimes we have to lean on fluids while we're getting access to inotropes or planning for some type of intervention. Um, and it's not ideal. You give, that, you give those fluids, you address the problem, and then you try to get the fluids off quickly to prevent lasting damage on the right heart. Jenna's got a question here. Did you discuss trying chemical cardioversion, like with an amyo drip, or did that also carry more risk of harm? Yeah, Jenna, great question. So in this patient, um, we did we did talk about an amyo drip for this patient, um, and there were the the risk benefit discussion was basically we're going to be doing if we were to do an electrical cardioversion we'd want to do it in a way that's safe, where we're minimizing discomfort to the patient, giving some fentanyl and midazolam, but also a little bit scared of, you know, are we going to put ourselves in a situation in which she may need intubation? Whenever you're doing an electrical cardioversion, you want to have anesthesia readily available in case your, your, your sedation results in, in someone who, who needs respiratory support. Um, we were balancing that risk with the risk of having this patient on amyo long term, um, which I, I recognize that we could just have her on the drip, cardiovert her, and then stop the drip. Um, but we decided essentially to go with the electrical cardioversion because we felt that it would um, more acutely address the problem, um, more reliably address the problem, rather, um, as opposed to. Uh, uh, chemical cardioversion.
Um, thanks everyone for the great questions. I think this was an awesome discussion in all of our talks this morning. Um, thank you, Sri. Yeah. Um, we can go ahead and take another eight minute break and come back just a couple minutes after 10.50, so like 10.52 for our last talk of the morning. Um, thank you everyone.